And here we go. Welcome again. Uh, today's our seventh session. Um, and tomorrow's our last one. So our, uh, we're looking forward to having you on campus and, and this evening as well. I, um, our today's session is on academics and we'll have three presenters uh, joining us. And um, we'll always um, start with a quick rundown for uh, move-in day. I see a lot of uh, the same names, but in case we are joined by someone who's uh, doing this for the first time. On the 17th, we will, uh, everyone should have received their um, time that they are expected to be on campus on the 17th. Housing sent those out on Thursday last week. Um, and you arrive a few minutes before that, parking lot O, and then uh, walk over to PIAC, which is our physical education and aquatic center. Uh, you will um, pick up your uniform from there. You'll get a chance to meet some of the people from these virtual sessions and others who weren't able to join us uh, virtually over summer. And that's for parents. And um, eventually in about 30 minutes or less, you'll head back to your car and head to the res hall designated for your uh, move. Once you get there, Everyone except the driver will be able to get out of the car and go to your room. You'll have plenty of helpers to take you and your belongings uh, to the room. Please mark your belongings uh, very carefully with your name because there's plenty of people helping you. So everything needs to be labeled so they know to bring it to your room. So you will put your name and your room number on there um, to help folks uh, get you sorted out in your room. Once you're there, Please start, try out your uniforms in case anything doesn't uh, fit. You'll be able to go back that same evening from 4 to 6.30 to back to PIAC and swap out any, any sizes that didn't work out. After that, you uh, will be free until about 2.30 when you'll be heading back down to lower campus close to the quad and the um, RISA Auditorium. You might have seen that when you've uh, visited the campus. That's where we will we plan something uh, with leadership to meet with you. Welcome. We'll have some uh, snacks for you there. Um, and while the families are meeting with um, with folks, students are going to be those who belong to the core will be practicing their formation, and we will have a very brief uh, capping ceremony. All this should end by 3.30. And um, those students and families who are participating in our host family program will be whisked away to uh, meet the hosts that uh, you've been matched with. Um, there will be some uh, food available there. And uh, the rest of the families and the rest of the students will um, be free to either go eat a meal at the marketplace. The students can use their swipe and eat. Uh, it's, it's part of their meal plan. Families can buy a meal or you could go off campus and have a meal somewhere uh, in Vallejo, Napa, Benicia, wherever. And uh, you might want to do any last minute um, errand run, pick up something from Target that you forgot. But we need you back by 6.30 that evening back in your res, uh, res hall so that you can meet up with, uh, you have a floor meeting that evening at 6.30. Um, so you'll be able to change your uniform, do your errands, eat your food, be back uh, in your res hall by that time. Um, that's everything for the 17th. Comfortable shoes, dress in layers. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit uh, and be back on time. Um, we have been asked about registration. Registration continues. Uh, we have um, uh, we received we have uh, received all the transcripts, and we are registering block registering students now. Uh, that process will continue until August tenth. So hold tight. If you haven't heard yet, uh, that's the latest uh, by when you'll know August tenth. Uh, and that's when all our bills will be generated and um, and you will be able to make payments. The due date was August 1, which was extended to August 16th now. 
Um, I'm looking through all my other notifications. Um, we've talked about photos and all of that. We're looking good with, I'm still missing some photographs, but I think this group has uh, probably uh, helped their students upload their photo for, for an ID. All right, uh, with that, I'd love for our presenters today to introduce themselves. And um, just as a rule, I request all the presenters to refrain from answering questions in uh, the chat. Our audience is mostly families, but I know some students have taken an interest and joined us. Um, so I will read the questions after your presentation is complete. And if you will, please answer those as I read out the questions and not in chat. Um, all right, and we'll save the last few minutes uh, for anyone who is unable to type in their question because they might be driving or another reason, we'll open it up and um, we'll open up open up um, the, the, you can unmute and answer, answer, ask your questions. All right, uh, with that, I will look at my screen and the first person I see is Crystal. So Crystal, go ahead. Hey everyone, I'm Crystal. I'm one of the university advisors here on campus. Benita, are we doing just intros or should I launch into, I have a couple slides for folks also. Um, yeah, just go ahead and um, do your thing and then we'll go to Dr. Uh, Deanna Vides. And we also have our Dean of Students joining us and we'll give him a little bit of time to say hello. He will be joining all of you tomorrow as well. So you've got um, any questions you have for the Dean of Students. So with that, Crystal. Awesome. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, and I'm gonna start the presentation. All right, can everybody see this? Thumbs up. All right, thank you. Okay, so I'm one of your two university advisors. It's me and Katie. Um, and the cool thing about university advisors is we help all students, no matter the major. Um, we're kind of here to support you in anything that comes up. We specialize in academic affairs, but any questions that pop up, we can get you to the right place. So there's two of us. Um, here's a couple of examples of, of what we help students with most commonly, but seriously, I, I've helped it, you know, students with, with anything that pops up. But our specialties are around advising and registration. And if you have questions at the end of this, we can go over a couple of things. Um, so we help students build class schedules every semester. We can help you pick which GE classes you want to take, because sometimes you have some options with which life science you want to take or which humanities you might want to take. Um, and we help make sure that your schedule aligns with your graduation plan. Different students graduate at different times. So if you're a um, student coming out of high school, you might opt for a four or five year graduation plan. If you're a transfer student from community college, um, you might graduate in a couple semesters earlier. So we can really help you customize whatever your grad plan is, um, depending on you know, what the offerings are and getting all the requirements done. Um, we also help with college success tools. Um, so we help a lot of students who um, need some tips on how to be a good student, right? So how do I manage my time? What is my daily routine supposed to look like? How much time should I be putting toward homework outside of classes? We can kind of help you establish a routine for being on top of all your classes and stuff. We also help coach a lot of students on like how to ask their professors certain questions. I get a lot of students and I know I was a nervous student too, even in my grad program, you know, going to an office hour and asking a question and feeling like it wasn't an important question, it's always important. And your success is our professor's success. When you do good, they look great and they really want you to do well. So I kind of help um, coach students with coming up with how to ask questions about how they're doing in classes and kind of identifying, you know, areas you want to improve in. I also help with GPA calculations. So if you have like a threshold you're trying to get to because of a scholarship or anything, I can help you calculate that. Um, we also connect a lot of students with resources. So I have a lot of students who come 
And they say, you know, I, I really don't know how to pay my bill online, or I'm not sure if I qualify for financial aid. And even though I'm not financial aid or I'm not financial services, I can connect you with our folks. Um, so you and I can work together and, and send an email or make you an appointment. You know, hey, Saul in financial aid, Tim has this question specifically. He wants to know if he qualifies for this. Um, he's going to come to your office tomorrow. Uh, is that okay? So I can help kind of do that soft handoff for you to ask those other questions. Make sure you get to where you need to go. Um, I basically know everybody, just like Vanita. So if anything comes up, even if it's a weird question, like where do I park my car? Like, let me know, I can help you find anybody. And the last thing we work on with students is sort of forms and policies. So if you are looking to change your major or you're looking to take over 20 units because you're trying to graduate quicker and you have done really well the past few semesters, um, or even if you're placed on academic notice because maybe you didn't do super great in a semester, I can work with you on what forms you need to fill out, who you should be working with, how to get your grades back up. Um, so I help with forms, policies, and academic notice students also. So those are some of the big things. You also have a faculty advisor and you'll learn more about them on Monday of orientation. So you guys get here Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday, we'll kind of do a big academic day where I'll talk with you guys again. So will Katie um, and our tutoring support folks. And then um, you'll meet with your majors and specifically your faculty advisors and chairs. Um, they're really, really cool because they're professors in your major. They're in the careers that you're going into. They kind of know why you have to take that ship stability class or why the supply chain course is required for international business and logistics. They are folks who like are you in 20 years. Uh, I am live, breathe, and die CSU. So I am the the definitely like the general advisor that gets you graduated on time and gets you hooked up with resources. There's a couple different ways to connect with us throughout the semester. Um, we are in the Student Services Building. You'll learn where that's in later. Um, for quick questions, you can always email us at advisor at csum.edu. You can also make appointments with us through Passport Navigate. And if you just kind of Google on our website, Passport Navigate, it'll pop up and you can get the link to um, make appointments and stuff with University Advising. And then we have drop-in hours Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. So we've got this drop-in hour that you can come by and just ask random questions. The drop-in hours um, coordinate with, we usually don't have classes on Tuesday and Thursdays from, I want to say it's 11 to noon. So you'll always have um, availability to drop in if something comes up and you shouldn't have to wait at all to see a university advisor come by anytime. Um, and we expand those drop-in hours during the registration period too. Um, this is the QR code to make appointments with us. It'll be kind of posted all over the student services building, um, but it's really easy. You just log in with your single sign-on credentials and it'll say, who do you want to make an appointment with? University advising. And then you can pick, you know, anyone or Katie or Crystal. I bet you all have a lot of registration questions or a couple of scheduling questions. Um, I believe we're going to be doing open registration next week sometime. So you will all get an email as soon as we're done block registering everybody. Um, and the email will be from our registrar, Miss Julia Odom, and she'll say something like, Hey folks, everyone's registered. I've opened up registration. If you want to make any edits, feel welcome to swap get, you know, sections and stuff. But please, please, before you drop a class, make sure you're either swapping it for a different section or you're asking before you drop it. Um, if you drop a math class or if you drop um, like a deck lab or, or something like that, it could impact your ability to graduate in four or, le or less years. So Really, really make sure before you drop a class that you ask an advisor um, if it's okay. And we can kind of talk through, could you take it next semester? Do you need it at all? Um, but if you're enrolled in it, we've looked at your submitted transcripts and we've determined you need it unless something's outstanding. And then we can have a conversation. So I know that was a lot of information. Um, we'll take questions at the end. Any questions right now before I pass it to my colleagues?
I'll keep okay. an eye on chat uh, for you, Crystal. Um, just so we know that majority of your audience is families. And uh -huh. um, so they're, they're listening to all of this, knowing uh, that their students will get a chance to meet you and get this information directly from you on Monday, as you mentioned. Um, but I wanted to kind of put it back out there that it's families listening. And we have a couple of students on here, but mostly families. Okay, um, perfect. So then perfect. families, <laughs> if your students have any questions, please <laughs> say, did you email advisor at CSUM? Because they can connect you with your next step. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Awesome. Thank you. All Thank right. you, everyone. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Vides. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is uh, Dr. Deanna Vitas. I am the Disability Coordinator here at Cal Maritime, and I welcome you to our uh, fall 2024 semester. Um, I am responsible for helping to connect you with uh, your faculty in a manner that supports your access to accommodations and being able to make sure you as a student uh, and family um, of a student who may have a disability are being able to um, access with accommodations your uh, curriculum and, and all parts of your program as applicable. I um, do have a little bit of a guidebook to share with you. And um, let me see if I can get that on screen. Give me one second. Um, please let me know if you can see this. Is that showing up for you? Okay, wonderful. So with this particular guidebook, it, it was my, initially it started out as a labor of love for myself. <laughs> and I say that because even though I, I've had over uh, 20 plus years of experience as a school psychologist working in the K through 12 setting. I uh, last year was my first year as a disability uh, services advisor. And so I um, put this together with the intention of helping myself. But then as the year progressed last year, this became a project, not just for myself, but in general for our student uh, population and our, our school community at large. So it's my hope that you find this as helpful as uh, I have, and um, we'll also be um, seeing varied uh, editions of this as the years progress. Um, with this guidebook comes with our land acknowledgement. We're just recognizing that as a community, we are um, established on a land previously, um, the home of our indigenous peoples, and just making sure that we treat our uh, home here at Cal Maritime accordingly with, with love and respect. Um, this contents of this uh, guidebook are pretty uh, con inclusive of different areas that would be impactful to you as students. Um, I do want to take a quick moment to introduce also uh, in attendance with us our Dean of Students, Mr. Lennon Prothro Jones, who does also provide oversight to the Accessibilities and Disability Services Office. Uh, he is my go-to partner in all things related to accessibility services and when, especially where uh, there is a question around accommodations and also um, how those accommodations may be translating into other aspects outside of the classroom setting. Uh, I, like my partner on uh, camera, um, uh, our university advisor, Crystal, she and I will be both in the same place this year in the student services building, uh, the testing center where you might be taking proctored tests uh, is also located in the student services building uh, to, I will say, to initiate uh, contact with me. I uh, would also be um, asking you to fill out an intake form where as a student transitioning from uh, a high school or, or community college with a, an IEP or 504 accommodation plan, you will, what changes for you from being covered under IDEA or the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, moving from that setting to now being covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act, you, it is now your responsibility to disclose your disability to myself and to the university that uh, being a student with a disability, you do need these services and you are making that initial contact with me. Uh, it is on you now to do so versus the school team pursuing that with you. 
Are there any questions so far? Any any wonders? Okay. So I'm gonna go on just to um, again indicate to you that our services on campus are, are confidential and they are kept separate from the a larger database um, in that you know this 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 is information that we need your permission to share. Um, I, in the spirit of confidentiality, uh, speaking to students who may be on this call, I would be um, needing your permission to uh, work with your families, uh, your parents, any guardians that are advocating for you. I will need your permission as the student to be able to, to disclose your personal information to them. And so as parents, um, I imagine this is gonna be a bit of an adjustment because you may be used to contacting your child's case manager or um, advocating on their behalf uh, all, all throughout their uh, educational experience. And so now as a, as a student at a college, it is important that they take on that uh, responsibility and that um, they give permission before I'm able to speak with you directly on their behalf. And that goes toward our, our FERPA laws and guidance. Their, the rights and responsibilities of students with disabilities is quite extensive, but in general, the intention is that, you know, as students, you have a right to equal and equitable access and opportunities to engage, uh, to be successful on campus. Um, you, as a student, are responsible for meeting the qualifications that would allow you access to these services. And also, to your benefit, it is important that you engage in an interactive process with myself as the coordinator of disability services here on campus, interacting uh, well with our office that we um, are able to really establish a unique um, profile for you, a unique accommodation plan for you that really touches you holistically versus one only one aspect of your educational life. It is important that we cover all the bases so that we don't leave any stones unturned and making sure that we are meeting your needs overall. Just going on, documentation, what does that look like? Um, where students are coming from uh, a high school setting uh, or even a community college with plans, um, we do have an intake form that is uh, something you can fill out online and it is something that allows you to uh, upload a copy of a prior um, individualized education plan you may have been found eligible for. Also, you can upload documentation from your treating practitioners. Uh, that could be a doctor, a therapist, or any other licensed treating professional that is able to establish your threshold of functional impairment that then leads us to have a, an, a conversation around what how that functional impairment um, impacts your capacity to engage in your educational program. So that documentation is important because it establishes your need. It also uh, supports dialogue between us. Any questions there? Going into the eligibility process. So in addition to applying for admission to Cal Maritime and being accepted, um, we do again go with the completion of that intake form and then also having that accommodation review meeting. Uh, and then there we develop an accommodation plan if you do meet eligibility for that plan. And that letter, uh, those accommodation letters are generated um, and then provided to your instructor. It's um, if you are a returning student and are a part of this uh, audience to, um, today, um, it's important to recognize that within those first uh, two weeks, at least, uh, as we get started and prepared to enter into the fall 2024 uh, term, or even in those first two weeks back into the term, it's important that you are making contact with the ADSO office so that we can uh, begin to review and reevaluate your need for accommodation and making sure that you are set up with it with the accommodations you need for your courses and any other area of your educational life that is impacted by your your documented disability. 
So um, while I have started a running list of students that I will be making uh, uh, outreach to the, between now and the start of term, um, if I if you are new to the to the campus, I will need you to uh, send me that uh, in email or even stop by my office um, to uh, get that conversation going. Going into uh, what accommodations and modifications look like, um, potentially we may be considering accommodations for exams. So for example, if you've been eligible in the past for extended time on your test, or even being able to use a calculator on tests, those are things that we can consider. We may also consider accommodations uh, such as a separate setting or a quieter uh, testing environment, which is our test center on campus. Um, in addition, other accommodations may look like eliminating um, physical barriers, um, for I believe I heard um, information about parking earlier, in addition to just knowing where to park, um, sometimes it's important, you know, maybe you've suffered a, um, an accident or injury that requires you to be closer to campus um, in terms of parking. So there may be a specific parking lot that I might need to consider on your behalf and coordinate with our other campus partners, our, our police department on campus to sort through. So things of that nature. Um, Going into the specific, um, uh, uh, more specific accommodations, um, my office does uh, support students who, based upon the impact of their disability, perhaps it's affected your attendance. It's important to note that instructors do have their class policy around attendance. Uh, there may be a need to engage in conversation with them around how you know your disability has impacted your attendance, and that would need to be verified and through just conversation. Um, in addition, dining accommodations might be necessary at times for students who might have a particular dietary exemption, and the uh, accessibilities and uh, accessibility and, and disability services office does coordinate with our dining partners to make sure that we we have an opportunity as a campus to address your need and to work with you to remediate those concerns. In addition, for those students who are part of our core of cadets, um, we uh, do look at accommodations around formation and watch and perhaps even grooming standards, uniform standards, where your disability has an, uh, an impact on your capacity to engage in those areas of your, uh, your core program there. Um, so those are some things to reach out early about and to make sure you're coordinating, not just with myself, but also the Commandant's Office, for example, to discuss further. Any questions so far? Housing accommodations is always a big area uh, that is targeted throughout the, the academic year. Uh, there are a few different periods in the fall as well as the spring where uh, certain requests for accommodation, um, single room housing, perhaps off campus housing, these are things that tend to pop up um, on a continual basis. Um, but it is important to, again, understand that a, um, for example, a physician may advocate on your behalf or other treating practitioner may advocate on your behalf to indicate, you know, there is an, Im an impact of your disability on your capacity to engage within the larger dorm space. However, again, please understand that their recommendation, whether it be for single room off campus or other, is just that it is a recommendation and it is important to highlight that because it is the responsibility of the ADSO to make the determination regarding a reasonable accommodation. Outside practitioners are not uh, representatives of this office and they are not knowledgeable about the range of accommodations and, and resources that we have as a campus uni and university as a whole. And so it would be, or um, it would we would be remiss not to engage in conversation around that that continuum of resources and support um, if we solely went by the the treating practitioner's letter. 
So um, there are, uh, again, di different opportunities for dialogue around your unique needs, and it's just important to reach out early, but also to execute the different levels of of response to any concerns you may have in your living situation by starting out with following varying pra uh, practices and procedures that the housing department may outline for you. That could be speaking to your uh, resident advisor, could be going through mediation, uh, speaking with the director of housing. Those are some steps to take as well to remediate your needs. Any questions there? In addition to housing accommodations, we do sometimes have students who might have a need for an emotional support animal. Again, with verification from your physician and how this, uh, ha how having this uh, support animal um, uh, alleviates the functional impairment, those are all things that need to be documented and reviewed and considered by the office. Uh, there are some students who may outreach to the uh, ADSO for um, obtaining um, an exemption to certain um, certain expectations um, related to their uh, religious beliefs. And so, uh, again, this is involving dialogue and, and conversation around how your, um, your religious beliefs and profile um, do need to be recognized and, and supporting your functioning on campus. So again, I would just ask that you reach out as soon as uh, you can to um, help um, make sure that those concerns are captured and addressed as best as possible. Um, testing accommodations. Um, you know, this section here in the guidebook just to discusses with you um, the needs around communicating with the ADSO early and not waiting, for example, until the day before your exam uh, to tell your instructor, to tell the ADSO that you need to take a proctored exam. Um, there are different um, steps to take to schedule and to make sure that you are, um, that these extra uh, notices and, 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 no, and advanced um, communications are, are warranted because time and preparation goes into making sure that the ADSO has a copy of your exam that the instructor is in, is in alignment with yourself and the ADSO around your accommodations and just making sure that your appointment runs as smoothly as possible. So um, thank you to those of you who do that already and to um, just letting our new students know that it is important, that communication piece is important around making sure your appointment runs as smoothly as possible. Uh, forms. So I talked with you about our intake form. Let me for a moment, if I can, I'm going to stop sharing and just kind of show you what that verification of, of diagnosis or disability form looks like. I'm just going to switch to that um, tool. Give me one second. This is the form that is available on our website, but I can. it's also included in my signature um, when I do uh, email um, and correspond with students electronically. This form um, basically allows the ADSO office to um, determine, again, with um, consultation with you and your treating practitioner, what your functional impairment is. And so it's very dis. dis detailed in that it is ask, asking for the treating practitioner to identify your disability or diagnosis to help us understand how that diagnosis was arrived at and to making sure that we also very clearly understand what your level of impairment is. Is there a physical barrier? Is there, do you have difficulties perceiving information that which can come in the form of a learning disability? Are there limitations in terms of how you are able to um, get to, uh, get and are mobile around campus? So there are different um, areas to explore on your behalf. It's, and also this is a, a place where the uh, trading practitioner can discuss your needs in regards to an emotional support animal. 
there's also an area that which um, does also afford that treating practitioner to identify different types of treatments you may be undergoing. Um, for example, there may be students who have uh, been diagnosed with cancer and may have a need for, or even diabetes and may have a need for medication at a certain time. The physician is, or treating practitioner is also able to discuss the impact of medication and what that might look like on someone's vitality and their capacity to be concentrating or, or enduring for long periods of time within their, within their designated class. Um, this form does need to be certified and signed by your treating practitioner. Um, they will need to identify the um, condition, whether or not it's permanent or temporary, where it might be temporary. This could be in regards to someone perhaps who might be coping with uh, symptoms related to a concussion, for example, and there may, or someone who may be undergoing um, symptoms related to a, a surgical procedure. So there may be a, an official end date to their particular level of treatment. But this form, once complete, is shared with my office. And then from there, that in, uh, continues our interactive process and discussion about how you're impacted. Are there any questions there? I'm just keeping an eye on the time as well and um, making sure, excuse me, that um, I get through a few more bits of this guidebook with you. I'm just switching back to that guidebook. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Dr. Vidas. Yes. We'll, we'll give it a few more minutes before we start doing the questions and answers. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. So I just, I'll just leave it with the um, ADSO facts, back, uh, uh, sorry, facts and questions. Um, just one uh, uh, particular graphic here. Um, I'm sorry if I can shrink this a little bit more for you. Um, so basically, if you have an identified disability, you're going to complete the intake form. You'll schedule an accommodation meeting with the ADSO um, to prepare for that appointment. You're going to make sure that you've either uploaded your documentation or you can bring it with you to the appointment. Um, you're also encouraged to sign that release of information. Again, the ADSO does not want access to your full medical record. This uh, consent that you're providing is to support collaboration between the ADSO and your treating practitioner. And it is um, to your benefit to engage meaningfully and also um, where you are approved, your accommodation needs will need to be reviewed and um, approved annually or per academic term. If you do not have a disability yet to be identified or disclosed, it's just important to maybe schedule that appointment with your treating practitioner to let them know that you're thinking about this on for yourself and wondering and, and may have questions and they can kind of get, guide you through that process to begin to explore that on your behalf. All right, that's what I have for now. Um, I'll put in the chat my uh, email so that you can reach me and uh, go from there. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Crystal and uh, Deanna. Um, I'm just going to chime in. Yeah, quickly. I was just yeah. going to ask you. Do yeah, you have a yeah. few words to share? So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lyndon Prother Jones. I'm the Dean of Students here at Cal Mary Time. Uh, I do directly oversee uh, the Disability Services uh, Office, so uh, as alluded to by Dr. Vitas. And um, yeah, I think one of the values of just understanding whether it be uh, the, kind of the partnership of this particular call which is uh, our work with Crystal and Katie it really helps us bridge with the faculty individually to work on the academic needs for a student. Um, and uh, where we see temporary things, I think is where there's really value in understanding the, the, the value in the ADSO office. So uh, that short-term injury, that thing that can kind of happen to anyone. We have a lot of our students who are athletes, about 25% of our population are athletes. So there's likely a parent who are our guardian on this call right now who has a student athlete, that that twisted ankle, that, um, that you know any sort of kind of thing that kind of displaces them for a little bit there's means for even for for those for us to assist with things like proctoring for an exam um assisting them while they're traveling for sports uh, uh all these other layers so um 
Yeah, I think I uh, appreciate everyone hopping on and hearing the information. Um, if you don't have a student with disabilities, uh, there might be other times where our office comes in to support along with uh, our academic colleagues. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Crystal really quickly um, because I'd like for you to uh, kind of share a little bit more about the difference between a university advisor and a faculty advisor, and then we'll start with the questions that are popping up. Thank you. Definitely. So um, you're not required to see me. I'm here to support all students um, in whatever they might need. Students are assigned their faculty advisors, which is a professor that teaches in their major, and they have to check in with them at least once a semester before they register for classes. And this is really great because in that check-in, they're gonna talk to you about how are things going? Do you like the pace of the classes that you're at? You wanna um, go quicker? You wanna slow down? Are you gonna fail a class? Are you doing super well? And can we like, you know, pick things up? Um, and then they're gonna remove your registration hold. Um, so faculty advisors are really there to serve as sort of your mentor in your career, and then double check that the classes you're taking are moving you forward to finish on time. Katie and I help prepare you for that meeting if you want to kind of go over a schedule and your grad plan to review with your faculty advisor. And then we do all the other little things, right? Um, coach you on how to find a tutor. Um, let you know where your faculty advisor sits. Um, talk to you about if you're having like a roommate situation and you don't know how to handle it. Um, things like that, little things that you might not know who to go to. We kind of help, we call it holistic advising. Um, we also might reach out to students if um, a professor hasn't seen them in a while. A lot of professors reach out to us and say like, hey, I haven't seen Vanita in like three class periods you know, we hope she's okay. And I might call the student. Um, that doesn't mean we're able to do that for every single student and that we notice if any student misses one class, but we're really there to try and support our students as much as possible. So if anybody notices like, hey, you know, I haven't seen this student in a second, we might reach out and see if we can help you in any way. Um, that's called intrusive advising also. <laughs> but we really, we're just here to help you out and make sure you're doing okay. Thank you, Crystal. All right, uh, we'll go over to chat. Uh, the first question is, our student has a later check-in on Saturday. Can we come on campus earlier that day to see other buildings and the overall layout? Will the bookstore be open? Uh, slightly unrelated from our presenters today, but sure, you are welcome to join us anytime on our campus uh, and the bookstore will be open. Um, I believe they will open up around 9, 9.30 though, and they will be open till uh, about 3.30. So uh, come on down and check us out um, at your own convenience. Uh, but, regard yeah. yes. but only check in at your check-in time. <laughs> yes. Do not be late. Be just on time. Um, thank you. Uh, regarding the capping ceremony, it sounds like the students will need to wear their uniforms for the ceremony. They won't. You, uh, in their uh, initial issue, the uniforms they pick up from uh, PIAC will be a PT uh, uniform. It'll be a pair of shorts that's blue and a gray pair of, t uh, and a gray t-shirt. That's what they're going to wear uh, to uh, the quad. And that's what they will do their first practice formation in. And we will expect them to be in their khakis on first day of class, which is Wednesday. Is there a way to split the fall bill into three or four payments over the semester? If so, how do I go about doing that? Um, best to send me an email at orientation at csum.edu and we will forward that to the appropriate department and they will get back in touch with you. Is there anyone here who can respond to this? No, I, I think that's accurate. And financial aid tends to add a little detail. They'll tend to look at what the options are for that payment, if there's any other funds that might be accessible before determining uh, final cost. 
And then from that, they'll make a recommendation about what might be options for payment plans that's usually individual. Uh, so there's not a set, oh, here's the four month plan or the three month plan. It's more like, what's your situation? What might be available? Thank you. Um, are electives optional or required? Crystal. Yeah. Um, I would say, so if it's on your curriculum roadmap, and if you go to our website and you type in curriculum roadmap, it'll give all of the majors different roadmaps. If it's on the roadmap, you have to take it. It's not optional. If you took an AP class in high school and you got a three or higher, maybe it'll cover humanities or an English or something, but everything on that roadmap has to be taken. And it's a total of 120 units or more, depending on your major. Um, you just might have a choice of what kind of class satisfies that elective. And there are other options to test out of classes through um, College Board, it's called CLEP. And so if you speak a fluent language, you could maybe test out of it and get credit for your Humanities C2. So if you have a question about taking an elective, if it's required, come ask me, I'll help you through all the options. Thank you. Um, are the students provided Microsoft Office uh, Suite and uh, also Adobe, or should they purchase these products on their own? Very interesting question, but I personally don't have the answer for it. Do any of you? They, they are provided, um, and they just have to try to remember off the top of my head which office they go to, but I think if they go to IT, IT will assist them with either the uh, student, um, not the student account, but it's like a student code for them to get those uh resources, but Microsoft, we are a Microsoft campus and we are an Adobe campus. So the Adobe general suite, so not some of the highest end components aren't there, but the general creative suite, as well as the Microsoft suite, things like a uh, publisher, Excel, Word, uh, those uh, elements are included um, on campus. Thank you. Uh, process of going, could we share the process of going from ME general to the license track? Yeah, um, so the good news is the first year curriculum is basically the same. Um, so before you make the choice to switch from ME general to the license track, you'll wanna meet with your ME major. So, um, and then if you decide you do wanna do that, you'll fill out a change of major form, which is on our student forms page. So I would take the opportunity to get to know some folks on Monday the 19th and start those conversations and then um, into the semester, you can make your decision on on switching over and and good news, you got time because everyone takes an ME first year is essentially the same for licensed and general. Thank you. Uh, what is the fall payment due date? That's uh, August 16th. We pushed it from August 1. Um, does having a 504 plan constitute having more help academically at the campus? My, my thoughts on that, it's not about more. It's about you getting what you need that makes the makes the learning environment equitable and fair for you. Um, most instructors on campus have general best practices that they are utilizing in their classroom settings to make sure that students have what they need. At the same time, a 504 plan provides you with additional protections under the law. And so it's just important that as an individual who may or may not have an, a plan in place that you are not shying away from disclosing because you don't necessarily wanna be perceived as different or um, perhaps um, treated, you know, uh, perhaps unfairly or, or viewed differently. I think it's important that there is an active conversation around having a 504 plan or other type of support and that it's um, that the conversation happens just so that I've, I've just had students who have been hesitant to disclose this and then they have unfortunately experienced hardship in their classes when perhaps if they had disclosed this sooner they would have been able to gain the support that they needed at the time that that was earlier rather than later for them. And maybe to piggyback really briefly, I would say is we will serve all students to the best of our ability. I think the difference with folks who are coming in already 
uh, who have like things like a 504 plan, it gives us a bit more of a reference for their starting point. Um, whether that be prior accommodations they've already tried and those different elements. I think we, if we're starting from scratch, we'll, we'll try multiple things and work with the different faculty and the student and the learning environment they're in uh, to best apply those, those um, accommodations and how we can serve them. But it's really more of a starting from zero or starting from a, a, an already set plan um, or at least set approaches that we can try to apply in our setting. Thank you both. Um, I have a class from community college that did not transfer to for some reason. Would, who should I talk to about that? I would love to take a look at it. If you email advisor at csum.edu, I don't approve classes to transfer over, but I'm so good at taking a look and kind of seeing um, where it would fit or why it maybe didn't fit in the curriculum. And I've had students provide, you know, we kind of dig in a little and we realize, ooh, maybe, you know, this is titled kind of a unique way, but it does sound like it should fit a area C2. So if you send me that information at advisor at csum.edu, I'll take a look and let you know what I think. If we want to fight for it, we'll we'll uh, ask some chairs about it. Thank you. Um, I got an email on Thursday about Alex PPL assessments for class placement. And I was curious how these factors, uh, this factors into class placement as I was under the impression I didn't need to do any anything else for registration and don't recall this being brought up before. I can help with that. Um, folks who are going into an engineering major, so mechanical engineering, either licensed or general, um, marine engineering technology, facilities engineering technology, um, you usually come in calc ready. Um, and we used to base that on, you know, how what classes you took in high school, but we have found that sometimes students perform better than maybe the high school course they took, or they would benefit from going down um, a math class and kind of, you know, um, refreshing some stuff. And this Alex test tells us that. Um, so um, we, I recommend if you're in those majors to do the assessment, not only is it an assessment, but it's kind of a, a refresh of all the basics that you're going to need to go into Calc 1. Um, and um, if it determines that you're going into college algebra and trig and then Calc 1, that's really helpful for you to know, because that's what we're going to place your math class based on. So do the Alex PPL before you get here. We'll also have an opportunity for anyone who didn't do it to do it while they're here, but I would recommend doing it before so you're not stressed out and squishing it in between these other orientation things. Thank you. Uh, will be will there be another Zoom related to academics for students who uh, don't have disabilities? Information related to majors and their curriculum, how and when they, can they change their majors and um, start with with one and want to switch, or do they just meet with their counselor at the start of the year? Crystal, you want to take that? Yeah, that is going to be all day Monday on orientation. You're going to meet with your major and they're going to go over the curriculum, the four versus five year plan, um, plans for transfers. Uh, and then you'll have opportunities to meet with us to change their schedule. And then once school starts, you can make appointments with me and Katie and just ask, you know, very specific, detailed questions. So in person Monday, August 19th. Thank you. How does one add a minor to their major and how do uh, transfer students know what classes went went through um, and how will their schedule vary to the traditional uh, four-year option? Yeah, I would say to add a minor, you should talk to me or Katie. Um, you could also Google, 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 search um, minors on our Cal Maritime website and it'll give you the, I think there's five different minors you can kind of look at what classes they are. You know, a minor really represents the small area that you're really interested in and want additional training. So it's usually five or six extra classes on top of your major. Um, you do have to fill out a petition to add a, a minor and you have to meet with a minor advisor. But Katie and I are a good first step. Um, and then for transfer students, um, if you look in your PeopleSoft student systems, student center, there's a little drop in bar that says transfer credit report, and that'll list all of your transfer credit and how we applied it. If you want help looking at that, 
uh, make an appointment with us or email advisor at CSUM and we can go over that with you. Thank you. Are there academic accommodations when students are standing watch? Um, um, some, oh, go ahead, Len. Yeah, uh, it's it's a it's a complicated answer, but I think the an example would be is um, I'll give two quick scenarios. One would be is that one a person has to be fit for duty to be on the vessel, uh, uh, if they are in a major that has them doing functions on the ship. So depending on the nature of the accommodation or the injury, there may not be something that is applicable that allows them to be fit for duty. So thus they can't complete that watch shift. Now, if they are pursuing a license, they still need to get that C time and they need to do those different things to make, make up for that lost time. Um, in other scenarios of, of uh, accommodations for, for watch standing or any other requirement, of their function, there's not any accommodation that it's like, you don't have to do watch, but that's a part of your academic requirement. It's more of how can we augment elements of what needs to be done so that you can complete the task if there is a limitation that doesn't prevent you from completing your degree, but also there's some slight barrier or some uh, cognitive barrier that may come up with doing it, uh, the task itself. Uh, it's so nuanced and there's so many legalese with watch in particular and pursuing a license as that is a baseline for that kind of approach that um, uh, it truly is case by case. And we try to actually work pretty heavily with the captain and others to make sure that they're in line with those regulations. So um, uh, there are slight augmentations that we can make, but there's no academic requirement that can be excused is the best way I would also uh, say as well. Thank you. With regarding students being provided with um, Microsoft and Adobe from IT, can they request this ahead of time uh, to set up uh, on their laptops or who to contact? So quickly, I think once they go into Office 365 that they've been provided access to already, they'll be able to see the entire suite that they can utilize. So have your student look carefully and log in via um, Office 365, and that'll give them access to all of that. It just kind of, it was in my head, and now I know what, where they can find it. Um, what about placement assessment for transfer students who completed most of their math requirements? Did we cover that, Crystal? So if you were given a link to Alex, I would do that. Um, the only other way we would waive math requirements is if you're bringing in a college class that's equatable to our math class, um, or if you took an AP or CLEP exam with a three or higher. So if you have a specific question about um, placement or if something transfers over, email advisor at CSUM and we'll let you know. Uh, go ahead. I saw the next question. Yeah, go ahead. Just uh, <laughs> we're, we're tight on time. So keep going. Check your email. Um, if you are supposed to take the Alex placement, it's in your Cal Maritime email. You should have a bunch over the past two months. Um, the electives for this semester, um, MT seem to be GOE 200 and lifelong learning and self-development, but my student was not assigned any electives when he received his schedule on PeopleSoft. Schedules are still being done, so they're not done yet. Um, you might not be in everything. They might just be placing everyone in math and everyone in this and everyone in that. So I wouldn't check your schedule until August 10th, and then we'll allow you to make changes on the 12th. So we're going back to the Alex um, concerns. So, okay, so more importantly, is the Alex needed for my class placements and therefore do ASAP? type deal. I'm working more than usual this week. So I was going to put it off for the weekend. But if it is crucial for class pl placement, should we, should he do it right away? <laughs> I would say prioritize your well-being. Um, you'll get time to make schedule changes. So I, the sooner you do it, they might change your schedule before the 10th. But if you do it after the 10th, no worries. We'll drop the map. We'll add you to map. Don't worry about it. Um, to, you know, prioritize you 
and we'll figure out the math. But if you, but I would still do it before you move on to campus if you can. If not, things come up. We'll get you into um, one of those slots where people can take the test. So no worries. So about Alex uh, during your orientation, every day there is a block of time where students have to do a swim assessment. And while a group of students is committing to swim assessment, the rest of the, the students will have, have the option to do the Alex testing. So you won't be uh, running ragged or uh, expected to miss anything of orientation. It's been planned and put into your schedule that if you're not taking a swim assessment, you, you should be able to go do this placement test. So keep that in mind. Um, I think other than that, uh, yes, according to math placement. All right, so that is all the questions that are in chat and I will allow anyone who's not been able to um, put things in chat to, yeah, there you go, JP, you got, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Oh, sorry, I was just raising my hand because I think it's been three um, different meetings. I was typing a question and then the call ended. So I just wanted to make sure I threw that up. Okay. Hey, right, Mike's already unmuted. So um, something interesting, um, Loera, how do I pronounce your name? Uh, Crystal is fine. Crystal said, um, is if I um, get put into a math class and then I do the test afterwards, they might change it. Does that mean by default, I'm just sorted into wherever my math placements are? Yeah, it's based on your high school transcripts and college transcripts. So like, would it be, so I could just not do it then and I'll just be sorted into whatever I've already done then, I'm assuming then. I think so. I think that there's a default there, um, but it's helpful. So I would say I would do it so that you know where you stand in math and it'll either validate where you were placed um, and give you some refreshers or, so I recommend it, but it won't kill you if you don't. Okay. And also unrelated to math though, more to academics, um, they're uh, back onto the book that freshmen have to read. Uh, to my knowledge, my friend um, and me have still not read it. And my friend just under the impression he cannot read it and he won't get any academic penalties. So just clarifying uh, other than you'll be disappointed. What's the downside to not reading it? You won't be able to participate in the common read uh, oh. program plan that we have uh, in the sense that you'll feel like you don't know the material, but there are no other significant consequences. Mm -hmm. If you are an audiobook listener or want to commit to that, your local library will allow you to download the audiobook that you could work through. And I guess I will oh. chime in as well and say is, um, uh, in my role as Dean of Students, I would highlight that it is my encouragement that a person's start to their college career at Cal Mary time is not about avoiding academic responsibility. So it is my strong encouragement that to fully participate in orientation in the common read section uh, that you will have with your classmates. Um, uh, I would encourage read as much as you can. If there are barriers to completing the book, that it's at least to have a foundation in the story about foundation to be relatable uh, is better than no completion at all. Um, but uh, uh, that is not something I would I would want to um, uh, say is, oh, well, there's no penalty. I think the first penalty be is uh, potentially being the only person or some of the only people in your in your cohort who aren't participating on the first day or second day uh, uh, fully because you weren't able to take those actions. So start strong is the way I would say for everyone to start their college career, uh, not behind. Okay, um, what's the common read program? Are we getting more books than just this? Just this. Okay, thank God. Um, yeah, the only barrier is I just don't like reading. I got a four on both English AP exams, but I just hate reading. My mom made me take them. My mom. Okay, thank JP. you. Um, there was a question about what the book was, and it's Braiding Sweetgrass. And I put that in the chat. 
Any other questions? I'm sorry, what's the book? Braiding Sweetgrass. That is not the book I got. I got AI 2041. Crystal? I'm looking through my email and I do think it's the AI 2041. I know there was a bunch up for winning that, but based on my May 13th email, I AI corrected. 2041. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, JP. Okay, thanks. Oh, it sounds super interesting. I'm just saying AI, it's our future. Okay. <laughs> All right, it's 6.35 and I would like to thank our presenters, Crystal and Deanna and Lennon, thank you for being here this evening, extended, extending your day into this late. Um, and as always, gratitude to all the families who are so invested in their students and the few students who've taken uh, the time to be with us. Have a wonderful evening and we will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow is the last one. Uh, and that will definitely be for the parents. Uh, when we'll talk about learning to let go. So I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. Until then, have a great evening. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vanita. Thank you. Bye. Bye.